friends, it's always a delight to be with you. The great joy of my life is teaching and sharing history with you. One of my ambitions as a youth was to be a college professor. Well, I taught one half day filling in for another fellow, and that's the extent of my professorship. But now I consider this a classroom, and we're teaching you history of, if not local, of the area. Last week we had a very unusual subject that we didn't finish. Uh, we just came to one part of it, of the early primitive beds, pioneer beds, how they slept. And I'm sure that the question popped up in some people's mind, Lord, how did they sleep? Lying on leaves on a dirt floor, probably in a cabin, and first of all, not in a cabin, out in the wilderness somewhere. How did they sleep? Well, I'll tell you folks, had you labored like those pioneers all day long, cutting trees or dragging logs and rolling logs and everything, I dare say that you could have slept anywhere. Could you lay down and sleep? <laughs> well, it wasn't any railroad yards then, but I've heard, that's an old saying, could sleep in the railroad yard. Uh, if you had been worn out as most of those men were. And even the wives, having worked and labored all day uh, doing this or that show, they were just about as strong as the men. Uh, they could have lain down anywhere and slept. We got to the point where I left off by telling about the first crude beds, uh, sometimes a pole bed in the corner of a room where two of It'd be joined in two sides by the walls and then one leg out in the room. And usually all the bedding that was on them was leaves or something like that. Now we come to a different era. Uh, this not being so scarce for the beds, it made a, fer a fertile field for furniture makers they could begin to work and ply their trades. There were several furniture makers moved into this area pretty early. Rev, uh, Colonel James King, whose son, the Reverend James King, his name is on the King University here now, uh, he was one of the first in this immediate area to set up a furniture shop. He didn't make the furniture, he imported master builders of slaves who could make furniture. So one of them came from the slaves of George Washington. I don't know how he made it here, but he did. And he was the chief furniture maker. Well, one of the real, uh, I guess probably the most item made in that shop was beds. Well, that was in the late 1700s, after the pioneers had finally set up and some of them were prosperous enough until they could pay to have a real bed made. Uh, he made some very plain, very more or less crude, uh, what, to the extent of what they were made. They were made by a master builder and they were all right, but we'd call them rough and primitive now. But he also made some beds that bordered on the elegant. He made poster beds, for one thing, which later became a status symbol. If you had a fine big poster bed in your house, it usually meant you were wealthy. He made many of those. I know of at least two that may be still in the country. Uh, one here in Bristol in a home that has ever mark, now I say mark, ever distinguishing characteristic of a king bed. Actually, he should have had the name and dates put on them, but he didn't. And I know of one that's in a home on Holson Avenue here in Bristol, Tennessee, that may likely, I say more than likely, is one of the king beds. For there was another one made that I know was one of his beds, it belonged to his son, Reverend James King, that certainly was made in the King shops here on Beaver Creek. 
The shop was set up down Beaver, on Beaver at what they call Holly Bend. Actually, if you drive down the Bluff City Highway, you'll find Phillipswood Drive. And if you turn right there on that drive, the shop was out there just a little ways on the banks of Beaver Creek. Uh, the one that I mentioned that I absolutely know was made in the King Shop is a rather elegant bed. It has fancy trims on it, it has fancy uh, uh, carvings and so on, and uh, is made of three different kinds of wood, walnut, cherry, and poplar. Poplar is mostly used for places that are not seen much, like the rails and the slats and so on. But it was thought fine enough until today, it is the pride and joy of a home on Richland Avenue in Nashville, Tennessee. Well, if you're familiar with what Richland Avenue is in Nashville, Tennessee, you know what kind of a place, neighborhood that it's in. And it's very much a prized object in, in one of those homes. Of course, the d owner is a descendant of Colonel James King, and naturally, she would be very pleased with it. But King wasn't the only one that made beds. The man set up at paper bill. He was French, that's all we know about him. We don't know his name. But he began to make beds for the masses that are moving in here fast. And oftentimes those beds were rather simple and plain. Humble furniture, you might call it. But in other cases, they were made to be very much the rich man's joy in his home. Uh, now, many of those beds at first, some of you younger people won't even know what I mean. When I say they were corded beds, or rope beds as some people call them, instead of having slats, they had holes or little knobs sticking up on the rails to where roping or cording could be worked crossways and then again another direction made squares of roping and then your feather bed or shuck bed or hay bed whatever you had was placed on that but as tight as as you could make those cords they always sagged in the middle always i've never seen one but what sagged in the middle uh, a man had one in an old mansion at uh, Meadowview up here, and his grandmother came to live with him, and she got rather senile and would get up in the night and walk around. Well, they put her on a corded bed because that bed was sagged down so that she couldn't get out of it. And even well people would have a time of climbing out of them if they sagged right in the middle. And like it or not, sometime you, you couldn't sleep on what you rolled together with somebody else. And if you didn't like that kind of a bed fellow, well, you're just out of luck because they're going to roll together right in the middle of the bed. You couldn't help it. I heard a story in a ta where a tavern, of course, they would put three and four in the same bed. And this woman and her foster daughter were sleeping in one of the beds. Long during the night, some other visitors came by, including two or three huge uh, Amazon type of Indian women. And they put one of those Indians in the bed with him. And before morning, they were all rolled together, and her mother thought that Indians in this country were still savage. And when the daughter punched her and said, there's an Indian in bed with us, she jumped up and ran downstairs, wouldn't sleep no more that night. But it's just little, you'll find that story complete in my book called Pioneers in Paradise. It's a very humorous thing. I laugh when I read it now sometimes. But anyway, the rope bed gradually went out of style and they began to make them with <coughs> slats, regular lumber slats. That was a great improvement. As the 1800s rolled on, beds became more common and, and finally, even well, when Bristol was founded, they were common articles sold in stores. And by that time, and for the next two decades, they became flamboyant. I mean, uh, Victorian beds, some of them soaring to nine feet high, 
headboards and with all kinds of fancy carvings and cuttings and works on them that just made them elegant. Seems that every factory tried to outdo the other, making fine, fine beds, each one trying to get a little finer. There's one here at Pleasant Hill that soars nine feet high. It just barely sits under the ceiling upstairs. Another very popular kind in the early days of bed making were the four posters, great, great massive post. Some of them soaring up as high as 10 feet, and maybe even taller in some particular cases. I think I knew of one that was 12 feet with the canopy over the top. That was very definitely a status symbol. Uh, one of those is in Jeff Davis' room here at uh, Pleasant Hill. It's not 10 feet tall, but it is a very tall one made in New Orleans. Uh, then, even though they had now, Joe Anderson, the first merchant, founder of the town, the first merchant in Bristol, he had a huge store eventually. And in that store, he had every kind of bed that you could imagine. Uh, in fact, he had bedroom suits, uh, marble top dressers, and so on. His son offered one of those suits to a woman who had the first article sold in that store, but she would not take it, and the article survived, and today it's in a home preserved here in Bristol. It was a little handkerchief or scarf worth 10 cents, but he did offer a bedroom suit for it, trying to get it back when he knew that it was the first article and would have historical value. Uh, beds became very cheap, as the time went on. Now, they, these big elegant beds that I'm talking about were not cheap, but you could get them for very little cost. Uh, as late as 1913, I know of a couple, uh, wait a minute, 1912, I know of a couple went to housekeeping, and of course they bought two beds at a store here in Bristol. The beds were not walnut or cherry, they were just plain poplar stained walnut. They looked like walnut. And they each of them had a little bit of carving, fancy piece at the headboard. And those two beds to start their housekeeping with cost five dollars. Two fifty a set. Now they'd be much higher than that in an antique shop. And of course, you know today how common beds are. You can buy a bed of any description you want about anywhere, but they had a long time coming this way. Now, a word about bedding. As the beds improved, the bedding improved. Uh, at first, they would make, uh, I guess you'd call them flat sacks. They call them bed tick, uh, about, about the size of the bed and they would stuff those with hay or with shucks. And rare cases, maybe leaves, but most of the time it was hay or shucks. Uh, a, bed, a mattress maker here in Bristol one time advertised that he wanted two ton of corn shucks delivered to his place. He was making shuck mattresses, even after they were actually made in mattress form. And people who could afford have to have a feather bed. They were considered good living people. They could afford feather beds. Uh, if they had, say, five beds and had a feather bed for each one, they were really up and coming in the world. And I've known cases where they would have a real thin feather bed made that you could lie under, lie on a bed, on a feather bed with a feather bed over it. And boy, that was nice and warm on frigid nights and in frigid rooms, as most bedrooms were in those days. I grew up living in a frigid bedroom, that is, sleeping in a frigid bedroom in the winter. And I know how it is. I couldn't endure it now. But nevertheless, they improved to feather beds, and that was a status symbol. I've seen in my time, I've seen women take a broom to smooth them down to make them look nice once they were made up. And woe we'll be under the child that jumped on the feather bed. He would be punished. Well, what they call counterpins or bedspreads begin to be made woven in beautiful colors and patterns and they're very much sought after now as antiques and some big white spreads with hand-tied lace 10 inches long. 
on the side of them, uh, they were very much common. There's some that can be seen in the Tazewell Museum. I sold them to them out of an estate here in Bristol. Well, you who lie upon comfortable beds, expensive beds, and sleep on a fine bed tonight, remember that probably, no matter how uh, well up in the world it may have been, probably you had an ancestor that slept on primitive beds as I have described. Until we meet again, may the best in life be yours.